Hello, I'm Alec Avdekov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. Hey, so I randomly went on a hiatus. Sorry I left you all on a lurch, but I just needed this time. Anyway, there are some new things to the podcast. If you really want to support me with research for this particular podcast, there is a new feature in the show notes below. I created an Amazon wish list that has different books that would help me out a whole bunch with research. This is the best way to help my podcast. You can also help financially support me on Patreon, and for only $5 a month, you can get special privileges and become the best Frederick the Great fans in the whole world. Also, feel free to follow me on social media and ask me anything about Frederick the Great. Thank you all for listening, and now I must go to the recap of the last episode. So, after Sir Robert Walpole's government fell, there was a movement in Britain to stop focusing so much on the war with Spain, and instead, Britain would commit soldiers to the European continent and fight in the War of Austrian Succession. In 1743, King George II of Britain took personal command of the British, Hanoverian, and Hessian soldiers that were collectively called the Pragmatic Army. The British Army then advanced and retreated along the northern bank of the Main River. However, on June 27, 1743, the British Army held off attacks from French cavalry and then French infantry garrisoned at Dettingen. King George has won a victory against the French. This was the very last time an active British monarch would personally command troops in battle. Also, I forgot to mention the casualties in the last episode for this battle. So, these are very rough estimates, but for the Battle of Dettingen, there are most likely a little over 2,000 losses for the Pragmatic Army on the British side, and roughly 4,000 French losses. In the last episode, we talked about Frederick the Great's reaction to this French defeat, and boy, was he mad! Today's episode has two main topics with a third subtopic. We will first look at how the relationships between Voltaire and Frederick proceeds in this time of relative peace in Prussia. Secondly, we will look into the diplomatic and also military situation in Prussia as it unfolds in 1743 and early 1744. If we remember, right after the Battle of Kosuzitz, a peace was signed between Prussia and Austria at Breslau, the capital of Silesia. This peace was signed on June 11, 1742. Now, Frederick figured that this peace would only be temporary because he knew how utterly angry Maria Theresa was that Silesia was stolen away from her. Maria Theresa believed on a deep ideological and personal level that all Habsburg lands that she inherited were unbreakable. So, even though she lost the most profitable province in the Habsburg collection, it was the fact that Frederick stole a land that was rightfully hers that really ruffled her feathers. Both Frederick and Maria Theresa thought that they owned political legitimacy, or the right to the throne, based on who owned Silesia. But we can get into that diplomatic mumbo jumbo later. Let's talk about what Frederick was doing with his newly won peace. Throughout the war, while commanding troops on campaign and battle, he was also writing to one of his favorite philosophic heroes. The man he continued to write to was who else but Voltaire. Voltaire will have his own episode if the War of Austrian Succession ever ends. However, this episode will focus on the relationship between Voltaire and Frederick throughout the 1740s. So, the very first time Frederick met Voltaire was in September 1740 in the Prussian province of Kleve in what is today southern Netherlands and western Germany. Frederick had the flu at the time and rose to meet Voltaire despite how faint he was. This gesture deeply impressed Voltaire considering how humble the king looked. However, a man's character is judged by his actions. 
The pacifist Voltaire was therefore freaked out when he heard about Frederick's invasion of the Austrian province of Silesia. While Frederick boasted, quote, I have crossed the Rubicon, colors flying and drums beating. In a letter to his chief minister, the peace-minded Voltaire was shocked and appalled. However, Voltaire hid his disdain in his letters to Frederick. He charmed the heck out of the king and even compared Frederick to the military geniuses of Charles XII, Gustavus Adolphus, and Achilles. Mind you, all the correspondence between Frederick and Voltaire were in French. Voltaire therefore graciously called Frederick Mon Chiro, Mon Roi, Grand Appaillon d'Allemagne, or in English, my hero, my king, the great Apollo of Germany. Apollo, of course, being the Greek sun god and god of truth. For Frederick to read these words from his greatest philosophic hero was truly magnificent. I'm sure this praise will definitely not cause Frizz to have an overinflated ego at all. However, the cracks were beginning to show in the relationship between Voltaire and Frederick. In fact, there is something that I have yet to tell you that Voltaire was doing behind Frederick's back. While the majority of the letters between Frederick and Voltaire were about how silly the doctrine of Christianity was at the time, a few touched on politics of the day. Voltaire was actually hired by the Kingdom of France to send some of his letters to Foreign Minister Cardinal Fleury. That's right, the philosopher Voltaire was a sort of spy working for France. The idea was that Voltaire had a personal relationship with Frederick, a kind that French diplomats could only dream of having. So, if Voltaire could persuade Frederick to rejoin the war on the side of France against the Anglo-Austrian alliance, France would no longer have to fight the War of Austrian Succession alone. We will eventually get into the full military and diplomatic situation of Europe and how Frederick fits into all of this, However, we must start with the first cracks that form in the personal relationship between Voltaire and Frederick. In October of 1742, Voltaire wrote a letter to Frederick to try to help a man named Baron Furstenberg get out of prison. He was tied to a woman named Countess Waldstein who came to Voltaire to appeal to Frederick. Voltaire really took his time to guilt trip Frederick. He wrote a poem that roughly translates to, quote, I asked her why her beautiful eyes were shedding tears. She, in a charming manner, said, It is the fault of the king. Frederick simply replied to Voltaire that, one, he didn't know who Countess Waldstein is. Two, Baron Furstenberg had, quote, behaved with insubordination. And three, he's going to stay in prison. In another letter, Voltaire tried to get money from Frederick. In particular, two and a half million florins for this Dutch colonel who raised the regiment and did not receive his compensation. This time, Frederick didn't even bother to answer this demanding letter. However, this did not truly affect the overall relationship. Voltaire continued to compare him to great historical figures such as Augustus and Julius Caesar. Frederick remained enamored by his philosopher hero and asked Voltaire to visit his court at Potsdam in June 1743. Unlike another unsuccessful attempt to meet in Aachen the year before, Voltaire said that he would travel to the Prussian capital in August of 1743. In August, Voltaire arrived at the heart of Prussia and saw Frederick's mother first, Sophia Dorothea. Frederick and Voltaire had two differing goals during this visit. Frederick had the dream of having the most sophisticated court in Europe and wished to have Voltaire as a permanent member of his court, whereas Voltaire was taking his job from the French government as diplomat and spy very seriously. Voltaire even wrote a letter advising Frederick on his foreign policy. Voltaire wrote, quote, Have you, sire, any other ally than France? In the margins of Voltaire's letter, Frederick wrote, quote, I have nothing to fear and nothing to hope from France. If you like, I'll compose a panegyric on Louis XV without a word of truth in it. 
I had to look this up, but a panegyric is a speech that praises someone. He had completely torn apart Voltaire's line of thinking that Prussia must be an ally of France. However, the next day Frederick wrote a letter fully clarifying his belief by giving honest criticisms of French policy. Frederick wanted Voltaire to discuss poetry and philosophy rather than politics. Frederick then offered Voltaire a court position at Potsdam and a pension of 12,000 francs in October of 1743. Voltaire still had this proposition when he left Prussia later that month. He went back to Madame du Châtelet in Serre instead of staying in Potsdam. Voltaire departed as a failed diplomat and spy. He had no political influence over Frederick in any sense of the word. This personal relationship between two iconic men of the century had no influence on what Prussia would do next. Instead, the correspondence between the two of them would proceed and they would continue to laugh at Christianity. Voltaire came to Prussia for three months and then left with little fanfare. Meanwhile, there was a huge diplomatic battle of wits in Europe that took place during the year and a half after the Peace of Breslau between Austria and Prussia. After Dettingen, there was a stalemate between the French and British where neither side could gain an advantage over the other. However, in September of 1743, Austria did some backdoor dealings in Italy. The Treaty of Worms was an agreement between Austria and the northern Italian state of Sardinia Piedmont. Side tangent here, Italy was not a unified state at this time and was similar to the Holy Roman Empire where the peninsula was a bunch of independent states that differed in size. One of the most powerful Italian states at this time was Sardinia Piedmont, which was located in the northern part of Italy. Side tangent over. The terms of the treaty between Austria and Sardinia were that Sardinia would accept the pragmatic sanction. Now, if you want to recap, go back to the episode The Habsburgs and the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713. In short, Sardinia would recognize Maria Theresa as the head of the Habsburg Empire. Sardinia would also provide 45,000 troops to fight against the French and Spanish forces in northern Italy. In exchange, Sardinia would receive Habsburg land in Italy and a 200,000 pound subsidy from Britain. This would strike a further blow against France and stretch her resources even further. Austria then had talks with Emperor Charles VII, formerly the Elector of Bavaria. Austria wanted to annex Bavaria and Charles Albert would be compensated with land in Italy. Frederick was looking at all of this with complete dread and anxiety. The less pressure there was on Austria, the higher probability that Austria would take back Silesia from Prussia in an invasion. In a future episode, we will take a look at what happened in the Russian Empire during the early 1740s. But in short, it looked like they might join the war against Prussia. Another factor was Saxony which shared a fairly long border with Prussia. Maria Theresa of Austria was negotiating with Saxony about a possible alliance against Prussia. It was the question of Saxony, not the persuasive power of Voltaire, that led old Fritz to turn to a French alliance. The idea was that Frederick would advance into Bohemia in August of 1744 and then take the regional capital of Prague and possibly try to take Budweis, which is roughly 80 miles or 130 kilometers south of Prague. The Austrians would most likely move troops away from France's borders to respond. Frederick then believed an army composed of soldiers from German states and French troops should retake Bavaria in the name of Emperor Charles VII. This would simultaneously strike against Austria and would surely cause Maria Theresa to negotiate. Nevertheless, there were a few German states that threw a monkey wrench into the works. Hesse Kassel and Hanover. Hesse Kassel was an elector state, meaning that the ruler of this state would cast his vote to elect the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. 
the main export of this electorate was soldiers. That's right, it would sell off soldiers to the highest bidder in the European market. Yes, these were the same Hessian soldiers that would be famously sent to North America for some internal affair in the British colonies, I don't know. Hesse Cassel, during this time, sold a majority of his soldiers to the British. The Hessians, therefore, would stand in the way of an army made up of Holy Roman Empire member states alongside the French army. There was also the electorate of Hanover. This state was in a personal union with Great Britain, meaning that they had the same ruler in King George II. Hanover, therefore, was a staunch enemy of France and would never consent to an imperial army against the Habsburgs and alongside France. One of the main preconditions Frederick had for joining the war against Austria was a French declaration of war against Britain, Hanover, and Austria. Yes, after fighting pitched battles, conducting sieges, and exhausting military campaigns with French and Austrian troops opposing one another for three years, the states of Britain and Austria were not legally at war with France. So, in April of 1744, France finally declared war against Britain, Hanover, and Austria after three years of bitter fighting. The illegitimate son of Augustus the Strong, named Maurice de Saxe, led French soldiers into the Austrian Netherlands in what is today Belgium in April as well. We will definitely have a special episode about this supremely interesting character in Maurice de Saxe. Now it seems that it is only a matter of time until Frederick will do as he plans and invade Austrian Bohemia in August of 1744. However, there is one unknown factor. How? will the Prussian military perform in this new war. Christopher Duffy's book, titled The Military Life of Frederick the Great, has this quote that illustrates Frederick's post-war understanding of warfare. Duffy writes, quote, The lessons of the recent campaigns were perhaps more directly reflected in the instructions which Frederick composed specifically for the cavalry. That's right. It was the soldiers on horse, not on foot, that needed the most reform in the Prussian army. The hussars, or the light cavalry that is used for scouting, in particular, needed to move in larger groups. During the First Silesian War, Frederick's hussars were picked off by Austrian hussars in larger numbers. This led to the less accurate scouting on the Prussian side. The new groups of Prussian hussars would be roughly two to 4,000 men and would need to act more independently than in the First Silesian War. Lessons were learned from the Zieten Hussars and the Bayreuth Dragoons in their successful operations against the Austrians. Then there was a crucial new development that continued to be relevant for European militaries until 1914, Autumn Maneuvers. These maneuvers put Frederick's military theories to the test and helped Prussian soldiers get used to the geography and combined arms movements between the cavalry and infantry. This was a massively influential innovation in military practice and was essentially a novel way for soldiers to train better. With both of these reforms continuing to improve the quality of the Prussian army, Frederick was supremely confident that his future invasion of Bohemia will bring glory to him forever. There is one last thing that must be said as we round out this episode. I will simply let this quote from Christopher Duffy in his book, The Military Life of Frederick the Great, speak for itself. Duffy writes, quote, In May 1744, the Principality of Ostfriesland came to the House of Hohenzollern by way of legitimate inheritance after the death of the last native ruler. Ostfriesland was isolated on the North Sea coast and was of no strategic consequence whatsoever. Well, there you have it. There was drama between Voltaire and Frederick, a colossal amount of backroom dealings with European power in the balance, military reforms in Prussia, and a new stepping stone added to Prussia's splotch of European territory on the map. Frederick is now poised to invade Bohemia and possibly even take more land from Maria Theresa. 
Who's to say what may happen next in the grand European chessboard? I hope you all are looking forward to seeing how it will play out in the next episode. To conclude today's episode, I will give you advice that I need to start taking myself. Be sure to floss.